Okay, exciting. Okay, well, welcome. My name is Kimberly Quinlan. This is your Anxiety Toolkit. Today, I am so stoked. Uh, today's a day I've been so excited about for quite a few <laughs> months. Um, today, I have Tiffany Rowe. Tiffany Rowe is a clinical mental health counsellor and a professor at Utah Valley University, and she is the founder and owner of Mindful Counselling in Utah. Uh, Tiffany is another CBT rock star, what I like to call a CBT rock star, um, <laughs> and also uses mindfulness and dialectical behavioural therapy. She's, on her website, she has information about what she's passionate about, um, that being helping clients remember that they are enough, and to help them um, ultimately find their purpose and self-worth. Um, and what the cool thing is, is how I came across Tiffany is through her Instagram, which she's very active on, and something caught my eye. And that something was that she had a post about how we should talk to depression like a gangster. And... <laughs> <laughs> and I lit up when I heard this because it talks to us like a gangster and I'm, well, some type of, some type of bully. So tell us your thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, maybe I should give some context in, into my thought process. Yes. Um, I'm from California and I grew up in an area uh, very rich in hip hop and rap culture. I grew up listening to R&B. Um, and so I already have a love for that type of music. So I come in with a bias and that's kind of why I, I've decided that's a good way to approach depression. It really is. Um, and my thinking evolved, honestly, one day it was like a sunny day outside. Um, I was running errands and a song by Ice Cube came on. Uh, I actually don't know the, the perfect name of the song, but it, Today was a good day. And I just stopped and like felt the sun. I had this like really mindful moment. And I felt the music and it gave me good feelings in my body. And I felt the sunshine and I was like, I'm happy. Like this rocks. I love this moment. I feel really good. This music's inspiring me. And I had this thought. I'm like, what if we could translate that in the therapy room? Can I use gangster rap? to create this feeling for other people. Uh, so fast forward to the end, it works. It does. Tell me what it's like. So um, you, I live in California, so I totally get it. But I'm, I'm actually was raised in Australia um, and didn't, wasn't, um, while I was subject to um, more of the hip hop thing, I kind of, I get the theory of gangster, but what does the gangster really mean in your mind? What are you, what are you really talking about? What does it sound totally. like? <laughs> it, it's what I think about is it's powerful. And this is, this is my idea about this. Okay. So depression is so life sucking and draining and creates a, uh, an inability to move forward, a shame, hiding, um, tiredness. And I, when I think of gangster rap, I think of power. I think of assertiveness. I think of directness. I think of getting up, speaking out, um, being loud, um, even being, you know, uh, over the top, cocky, whatever. And that's what I, I want to provoke those emotions and that experience in people who are like stuck in that black hole of depression. Mm. And so my idea is, is one, I want them to listen to music that's going to kind of snap them out of the depression, which sinks you and sucks you in and instead have something that kind of brings out a stronger emotion and empowering emotion like anger. And that's what I think the gangster rap does is it, it can kind of bring up anger, which is more powerful than depression. It's an opposite emotion of depression, and we can just facilitate change. So one, that emotion the music brings, but then that assertiveness and that empowering voice in the head that says, F this. I'm not going to sit here and, and hate myself. I'm not going to sit here and believe that all these horrible things are going to happen to me. Like, F the hopelessness. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to move. 
And um, that that's honestly like the thought process. That's how it sounds. Mm, right. Which I think you use the perfect word is it's empowering when you feel like you have no power, like you, you're hopeless and you're helpless. All those themes of depression that it can pull, it can kind of pull or um, create what was already in you and bring it out. Yes. Right. Yes. I love that idea that it's already there. They have these coping skills in them. We're just, we got to get through that fog of depression and tap into their power. Um, I see anger as a really valuable tool and I don't, I don't experience it as a negative emotion. It's, it's an empowering emotion. And that's, I think that's the, the, the switch for people. Right. Right. Which is so interesting because often I experience in my practice that people who have depression, whether it's primary or secondary to an anxiety disorder, is that it, the depressive voice feels stronger than they could ever imagine that they would be. Right. So, right. so what's your experience with that? Like, what are some of the, I mean, just for the listeners, like what are some of the, the, the voices or what is, what would a depression usually show up like in, for you? Oh yeah. Depression is very convincing. It, it is a very sly and cunning salesman. Depression comes in and tells my clients, yo, I'm here to stay and I'm never leaving. Right. Um, and I promise you I'm never leaving and you're always going to feel this way. So just give up. And that's part of it, right? They, it, it's really experienced as true. This will never end. Right. Right. And it's, that's that hopelessness and that 1000 pound weight when you're just laying in bed and you can't move. Right. Right. So, okay. So let's say somebody has, um, depression, um, a common depression that I, um, I hear from clients is there's no point, right? There's no point in you doing the treatment. There's no point in you reaching out to a friend. There's no point A, B and C, X, Y, and Z. Um, what would you say? What would you do with your clients? Would you bring out the music or what would you do? I mean, yeah, if you want me to use the gangster rap approach, we could. I would, I, I think a first question is there's no point. Is that a hundred percent true all the time? Right. Kind of like the CBT questioning, challenging. Does it feel that way right now? Have you had, have you had any experiences where that's not true? Is there anything that provokes a different experience? And then, so we could put on some rap. And I say, what's that feel like in your body instead? Does it still feel hopeless? Does it create a new sensation? Because depression is like any other emotion. It, it, it comes and goes and in in ebbs and flows. And in that moment, can we create a new sensory experience? And can they feel it in their body? Can they feel the bass really loud? And can they feel the vibration and snap out of that fearful, hopeless place and instead kind of get present with like, oh, wow, these lyrics are shocking this is like heavy. This is loud. I want to snap them out of that and bring them to right here, right now. And there are other emotional possibilities. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a funny story about this. Um, so it kind of goes against or contradicts what I'd said before. But um, I remember in my second licensing exam in California, were you licensed in California? Or? I'm licensed only in Utah. I've been here a decade. Okay. So I was licensed in California. We do two tests. The first is what we call the written, and then the second is the clinical. And mm -hmm. um, on the second, I had two of the biggest panic attacks of my whole life um, because I was just, I just got in my head and I was so freaked out. Um, and so as I was driving to the second test, after already enduring the, the chaos of the first one, um, I was already starting to panic and on my shuffle came Eminem's Lose, Lose Yourself, is it? Yes. 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 And something shifted from being in the moment of a panic attack. Not that I'm advising this being the only tool for panic, but something shifted in me where, and even the lyrics of Lose Yourself is talking about showing up in front of people and you just, um, you lose yourself ultimately. And it was so powerful. And so that's why I think I really connected to what you said is that you could use this same tool for panic and anxiety um, because it, oh, yes. it, it, took, it took away a place of feeling so small and really kind of shitty to, to know like kind of you go girl kind of perspective. 
So um, I can see that working for all of the enrichments. That's it. You got it. Right. Right. This right. isn't even about depression. This is about any emotion. And I love what you said. I mean, we, we use this technique with anything. There's distraction skills. There's head on facing skills. I mean, there's, there's a time and place for this, I think, for any emotion. I totally agree. Right. So P.S. on the story, just to finish it, midway through the exam, I had another panic attack and you're allowed one pass to leave and I left and I actually ran laps around the building because, and I was listening to the song because you know how he's like punching and he's doing the whole thing. <laughs> I'm yeah. out in the parking lot literally doing that because I had to sort of um, recreate a place of empowerment. So cool. That's, that's interesting. I can relate in an opposite way. Like when I was a teenager and dealing with depression and angst and mis being misunderstood, I would listen to the cure and like the Smiths, mm. um, to feed that emotion and to like connect to like despair and it fed it. And one of my favorite skills I've learned as an adult from dialectical behavior therapy, DBT is the opposite to emotion action. Mm. And that's part of the thinking of this is, okay, if you're feeling depressed, what's an opposite emotion and an opposite action of that? Instead of listening to the cure or the Smith, who I love, right? But if I don't want to feel depressed, I need to do something different. Gangster rap doesn't depress me. Mm. It gets me powerful. Um, so it's just an unconventional way to think about using really standard clinical skills, like this, this music to snap us out um, to connect to the emotions, to empower us. It's just, it's, it's fun. It's interactive. It's, it works. I love <clears> it. <throat> I do. I really love it. It's funny. I'm a definitions girl. And so before the, we met, um, I, I actually am not afraid to admit that I actually Googled the definition of gangster because I really wanted to understand, even though I knew what it was, I love to really get the understanding of a word. And yeah. it was talking about, basically being derived from a gang. Um, and sometimes I find it's helpful and I'm really curious to know your thoughts on that. W we use this idea of it um, in OCD of like, it's me against OCD. You're in that gang. I'm in this gang. Mm. Um, it's me against you. Right. Mm. Um, don't you tell me what to do. Right. Um, you, you know, you do not have power over me. Is that um, that kind of narrative approach of having it be a separate thing, something that you use and you find helpful? I love that. I am not my emotion. This is going to pass. And that's part of the mindfulness twist is just because you feel this doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it a fact. Just because you're experiencing this doesn't mean it's going to stay forever. It is not you. So that very much can fit. Like we're in different crews. And I don't want you to necessarily experience it like an enemy, but just to understand like this isn't me. I don't have to identify as this. Like I'm separate and I can feel different and I can create emotional responses that are not you. So that totally makes sense. And I love how it fits the definition of like being in a gang. Right, right. Yeah. I guess, Perfect. Yeah. See, it just ties together, which is why I was like, got so excited that we were going to chat about this. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just a simple concept that that can, I'll say it one more time. It's empowering. Um, yes. it, it takes away. And I love that it takes away all of that power that we, um, that it, it that depression or that experience of anxiety imposes on us. Um, I love this. Tell me about your mindfulness practice in your private practice. What, how does that work for you? Okay. So yeah, my business is called mindful counseling because mindfulness is a pillar of my own personal mental health and something I do with every single client who comes into my office. Um, that being present, being aware of this present moment without judgment plays into every single issue I come across in my office. Um, so it shows up in DBT. It's one of the modules of dialectical behavior therapy, learning how to be mindful and attend to your emotions. Like we have to get a clue that something we have to attend to what's up and what's going on before we can fix it. Mm -hmm. um, so it shows up in the DBT realm. Uh, when I do meditation with clients, just teaching them how to be present and sit with their stuff without freaking out, without running away, without numbing out or avoiding. 
uh, shows up with anxiety and depression clients. Again, trying to feel emotion and don't push it away. That's, that's how I use mindfulness with everyone. And, and if I had to boil down my job to one thing, it's helping people feel their emotions without judgment and honoring them, giving them space, um, being aware. So, yeah, I, I cannot think of any counseling-related discussion where mindfulness doesn't fit. Right. I can't agree more, again, which is why I love that a, a big part of your Instagram posts are about – um, really honoring each and every one of those emotions, right? Um, in in my in my clan, my people, my OCD po- and my anxiety people, because they're my people. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, we, I often have to, um, you know, we've just come from talking about like this gang kind of violence between us and anxiety or us and depression but I'm constantly also trying to separate that but also make some safety for just allowing fear like it's actually it's actually our friend it shows up for us every time we cross the street and it shows up for us every time you know in California the house wobbles a little bit my fear always is like hey just check yourself Is, is this an earthquake and I have to appreciate that and I love that you are constantly educating about making space for them um, all the emotions. Um, what do you have like a personal experience or an, or a client experience where that was really profound? I have a million experiences personally and professionally. I, it's, it is my favorite thing to do. It is my passion to teach people how to hold space and for them to have the magic happen. Um, I call this the magic pill, but I, probably most clients who come into my office, I'll do a guided imagery exercise where we scan their body, find the emotion, where is it? Say for anxiety, it's usually in their chest or their stomach. And we just mindfully observe it. And I'm like, what, what's it look like? What's its shape? What's its color? What's its temperature? What's its size? Is it moving? Is it stuck? Uh, what's its sensations and the key is you sit there and you don't push it away right and people are freaking out they're like oh, I can't believe I'm sitting in this I want to get rid of this but we use the trust in the process and our relationship and then we just validate it and we breathe through it and say it's okay to feel you it doesn't matter what they're feeling it's the same script so if it's depression or excitement or anxiety or joy it's the same validation like you're valid you're safe you're good I honor you. I hold space for you. I'm worthy of feeling you. I deserve to take the time to feel you. I honor your message. I will not push you away. By feeling you, you will pass. And here's the magic. Always. It always goes away. It's freaking cool. It's so cool. Um, So I, I do that with clients a lot. And the reason I do that is because I do it with myself and it works and, uh, it's magical. Right. It really is. It really is. And I think that is how we trust our body. Ultimately, you know, when we stop fighting all of those emotions. Yeah. Yeah. You do some work with eating disorders. How does that show up? Oh, yeah. Same thing. Um, I'm in recovery from an eating disorder. I've been fully fully recovered for over 11 years. Um, It's the reason I became a therapist. My, My passion and my drive was to help women one, recognize you can recover, and two, how to do that and supporting them. So a large amount of my clientele is women recovering from eating disorders. And so much of an eating disorder is similar to substance abuse in that it's avoidance. I'm not in my body. I don't want to feel. I want to numb out. I want control. I can't hold space for this. Um, So just like any other maladaptive problematic coping skill, it's like, hey, let me save you like $10,000 of therapy. You just have to feel your shit. (laughs) Like that's what it boils down to. Like, yes, you have to eat. Yes. You're going to have to come to terms with loving your body, but you have to feel stuff. Right. Um, and that's the mindfulness. That's that non judgmental acceptance, depression, anxiety, eating disorder, substance abuse. I mean, mindfulness to me is the answer. It boils down to that. Yeah. I'm on your team. You're on my team. We we are in the same gang. We are it, we are in the same gang, and and that's what I'm I'm a really big advocate for too. 
um, you know, just to reflect on that because I, I do eating disorder work as well. But when it's, um, but more so with the anxiety piece is often with OCD, OCD is, and, and I think it's true for eating disorders and um, body focused repetitive behaviors is not only do you have the feeling, but the judgment that that second piece is just trailing behind going and you're a piece of you know what. And, mm-hmm. and, and so I think that the mindfulness can, there's the CBT, right? And then the mindfulness just helps with that trailing behind piece, which is so yeah. important. I love how you acknowledge like, hey, I might say something that contradicts something I said earlier. And so is psychology. Like there is no one correct way. So in, in, we need those skills of like really facing and embracing. We need the skills to help us distract when it's too heavy. And it's, it's like both can exist. Both are true. Both have a place. Right. Um, I think it's cool to be able to give permission to, to people to, to figure out how this is going to work and learning all these skills for the right time and place for them. Right. Right. Do you use behavioral tools for depression? Yeah. So, um, the, the whole, like, let's use gangster rap to snap you out of, um, depression is related to CBT skills, but also just straight up, uh, behavioral activation stuff. And so I'll often go with clients and say, um, are you aware of like the behavioral activation acronyms, like action and trap and stuff like that? Right. So using those types of approaches of like, let's assess what's going on with your behavior. Are you stuck in bed? Can you not go to work? Um, Let's choose whether or not if we're going to activate an activity, let's go listen to some rap. Let's go listen to something that gets you really pumped up and create this activity, make it part of your routine, observe how this behavior feels. Um, So that would be some of the straight up behavioral stuff I would do, like logging behaviors, tracking that type of stuff. Um, well, I mean, it depends on the client, of course, but just different activities and be it journaling or exercise or whatever fits for them. I think there's a big place for all that behavioral type of stuff. Right. Right. And we do a lot of, you know, behavioral activity scheduling, right. To sort of make sure that there is some routine. Um, but I do really like sort of um there's a lot of research and this is for I don't I don't think I've spoken about this on the podcast but I've spoken about this on Facebook about this the the um research about standing you can't really see me um but in superman pose right or wonder woman pose whichever you resonate with um but just by standing in that position we can activate similar to the way that I'm guessing gangster rap or, you know, if my, if my husband was here, he'd be like, oh, don't forget punk music. Like that'll do it too. Right. So, yeah. but, so whatever it is, but, but even just a, a posture can shift the feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. Yeah. Um, so I, mean, I think that that's something that people can play around with. I've had clients who have struggled and I'm like, well, okay, I want you to stand. If you're going to tell me how bad things are, I at least want you to be in your power pose. Right. Mm. And it doesn't last, it doesn't last for long when you're in a power pose. Right. It's so cool. I love that challenge of like, okay, if you're going to say that, stand this way. Right. And how's that feel? Right. Yeah. That's really cool. Right. And so in the room, is there other things that, you know, maybe the listeners could try or that you try to sort of, again, where you're feeling depressed, but there's something that maybe you might use to sort of shift your, shift your experience? Oh my gosh. One of my favorite things to do is to make my clients so uncomfortable. <laughs> I love, I have, let me show you this. <laughs> I have this mirror right here. Going off script here, folks. Love it. Um, So I have this little mirror in my office. And when um, my clients start going down the snowball hill, right, they start really building up. I have a couple things I do. Um, One, I'll, I'll pull out this mirror and I say, you have to make eye contact with you. And I want you to say out loud and feel your heart and talk loud. I am enough. Like... I believe in myself. I love myself. I am beautiful. Um, and when they look at me, I'm like, 
look at the mirror, keep eye contact. And it makes them so uncomfortable and they feel so vulnerable that it snaps them out of the anxiety or the depression or the ed eating disorder, negative talk. And they get into this moment of like, I'm right here right now. Um, another thing I'll usually do with my clients is, um, there's lots of things I do trying to pick the best ones for feeling really powerful. We'll just do some, uh, body love statements. I'll have them put their hands on their cheeks and say really positive things about themselves, put their hands behind their neck or on their shoulders and just say like, I am a badass. like feel that that's purpose. Right. Just getting them to connect, to ground, to feel body sensations, to breathe, to speak, what can snap them out of that emotional snowball. Right, right. And for those who refuse, or does everyone, are you, are you uh, uh, what are those, you're not leaving the room until you do it kind of people? <laughs> <laughs> I think my clients know better than to step to me, but we, you know, back when I worked with a lot of teens, there was, there were some standoffs. But you went gangster on them. Yeah, they know I could get gangster. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think at this point, um, I have to think about that. What if someone refuses? I don't have, I, I don't really have that experience anymore. Right. They I, might cry through it and, and not enjoy it, but I just say, you can freaking do this. Right. I actually love when they do, I find, it, you know, that if a client resists, but is but is finally able to do it, even if it's um, that if quote unquote it's not a great job through their mind, like they didn't do a good job. I think it allows them to look. You know, we go, okay. So what did you learn? Right. Like, That's cool. Right. And and I lo- so I and I love that. The cool thing is probably for you is um, people who come to you obviously want change, so they're willing to try. Yeah. It's. But I mean, that's part of recovery from a lot of this stuff is that kind of pre-contemplation. I don't know if it's worth its stage. So I don't know how, I mean, I, I probably wait to do kind of more of this in your face stuff, you know, once the rapport is really there and once they're more contemplative or action stage style. Um, but yeah, I think it's good to get uncomfortable and to push through it. Mm. What would you tell, um, let's say the listeners who are on their own, maybe don't have a therapist um, and would are afraid to try this, um, you know, what would you tell them? I, I'd really want to get clear and say, really, what are you afraid of? And my, my guess is it's going to boil down to being afraid of feeling. And so, spoiler alert, like, your emotions cannot hurt you. Like, you cannot die from a panic attack. You cannot... Um, your lungs are not going to collapse. Your heart will not stop beating. Like you can feel this stuff and by feeling it, it's going to go away. And sometimes we have to say that 50 times before we get it, but like trusting that that's true, that that's research based. And another thing I would say is, look, everything you've tried obviously hasn't worked. So let's try the one thing you haven't tried, which is totally embracing this and getting uncomfortable. What if there's a chance that that works? And that logic tends to kind of be an anchor we can hang on to like okay I haven't tried this maybe this will work so take courage in knowing there's still possibility right it's an experiment mm-hmm. right there's actually a book I can't remember the name of it but it's actually a very short book it's like 25 pages but it's about a man he's uh I don't know if you've heard of it but he basically was a um a Silicon Valley executive who had um a breakdown of some you know some term of some the terms he doesn't really describe but he basically is unable to get out of bed and falls into a deep deep depression and basically he talks about how the thing that got him back is that for I think he said 13 days but don't quote me on that he looked at himself in the mirror and just said I love you over Mm -hmm. and over and over and over and over and over and that's basically that is the book I've just told you the whole book unfortunately (laughs) I'll link I'll link to it in the show notes if somebody really feels like they want to hear the details of his journey it's a beautiful book but I love that because you do kind of have to fake it till you make it preach 
So you have been um, really talking a lot about your self-care um, retreat, I think it is. Um, tell us about that and why that's so important to you. My pleasure. So um, I'm running a self-care workshop next month, and I think it's such a barrier to why people have so much beef with self-care because we have all these fears and beliefs like it's selfish. Um, I can't afford it. I don't have time. Um, I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy. There's shame tied to this. And I see it really intrinsically connected to why people can't face emotions. So kind of the long con here is we can sit and feel and our feelings are valid and they have space. And I see this so connected to self-worth and self-care and belief about self. So I wanted to, to really dedicate an entire day for an affordable price for a group of really empowered, like-minded people to come and to have this breakthrough of like caring for myself is, is important. I'm worthy of taking care of myself. I'm worthy of being cared for. My emotions are valid. My needs are valid. My values matter. And I can do this in a really realistic, sustainable way. Um, I just think it's so, such a connected part to mental health. I don't know how you can really recover from any of this stuff without saying my needs matter. It, it ties to everything and caring for yourself. So it's happening. We're throwing a workshop. I love it. I really do. Um, and and I, I agree with you on all pieces in terms of like it being absolutely a part of the emotional piece of it, right? Um, particularly because to have self-care, you have to experience pleasure. And, and while we don't want to um, feel all of our emotions, you know, feel our anxiety, that tends to numb pleasure too. Yeah. Right? It's, it's a big barrier. Um, so yeah, being able to hold space for that and feel that is totally connected to it. Right. I love it. I do. Um, how can people find out about the self-care workshop or retreat? Okay, so I think my main info hub is Instagram. And my handle is at Mindful Counseling. Um, and I have a link tree, so you can click my link and it'll let you get on my waiting list. Check out my retreats, check out my workshop, check out my website and my blog. Um, it just seems like an easy info access point. I have a link on my, mind, on my uh, Facebook page as well. It's also Mindful Counseling. And that's probably your best bet. It's an event bright. So those links will take you to like the information and the tickets. And it's just such a smoking deal. It's a full day workshop. We got lunch. It's only 250 bucks. It's crazy. And you're going to continue to offer these? Uh, I, yeah, the goal is to do a handful of events this year. I, um, I get a little too big for my britches sometimes, so I'm... <laughs> I don't want to make any promises that I can't keep. Well, I, the goal's four. The goal's four events this year. So right, okay. And you'll apply self care if <laughs> along the way if you need to cancel one. I reserve the right to say we're only doing two. Right, absolutely. Yeah, you've got you. You practice what you preach. That's awesome. I love it. Okay, so what I will do in the in the show notes is link to your website and your Instagram and your Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so before we finish up, because this is just so cool, right? It's a completely different, you know, we, I could easily have done this alone and just talked about mindfulness for depression and kept it really, you know, straight line. Um, <laughs> but I love this so much. And I think that it does, um, it is incredibly powerful and, and empowering. Um, what would you say as like a final note to people like we're talking about depression. We're talking about feelings in general. I know you've made lots of points here that are wonderful, but like bring it home. Oh, we're bringing it home, folks. <laughs> um, I guess here's the takeaway. We got to become best friends with our emotions. We need to accept who we are. We have to accept our brain, our body, our experience. Um, we can resist and hate this. Or we can make peace and really have self-love, which just opens up the doors for us to connect to others, to give to the world, to be our best selves. Acceptance. 
emotions is one piece, and I know it's hard to overcome that, but really getting in your face gangster with the idea of like, I can freaking love myself, I can accept myself. Um, I want that for people. It's possible. It's where the breakthroughs happen. Mm. Maybe what would be your go-to, or, or if you can't think of the name right now, what would be your go-to song? And I'll link that in the notes as well, just for people to try it on. Girl, I feel like I need. We need to make. A, I'm gonna make a Spotify list. Can we do that? Yes. Can I make a Spotify gangster out of su- sucky emotion playlist? <laughs> would you? Yes, I would love to do that. I love music. I have tons of playlists. Um, they're all explicit lyrics, probably. Well, I'm sure through iTunes, people could find a, a clean kid, version, a kid version. Um, yes, but like, what would it be? I, I mean, most people. So let's sort of say, for people who have anxiety and depression, their brain is probably calling them some pretty explicit names anyway. I've not. Okay. Yet, okay. I've not yet met someone who doesn't. Um, hear them call themselves some kind of profanity um, when dealing with mental health. Um, so, so if you were to just throw it out there, what would it be? Not that we're endorsing the language, but if, if um, we are. Right. Gosh, there's so many. What's one that's really speaking to me? Maybe. Sorry, I wish I just could hit you with. Okay, I got one. And this is a newer song that I'm really feeling. It's by Tyler, the creator, called I Ain't Got Time. Mm, I know what you're talking about. Do you? Yes. It's so good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me put that in. And uh, I will contribute a Spotify gangster mental health playlist. I love it. I'm so pleased (laughs) that we got to chat about this. Oh my gosh, this has been so fun. Thanks for letting me talk about my my ways. I love it. I mean, we need these ways because sometimes people will even come to me and they're like, I've actually done CBT before, right? But, but we have to bring in a creative piece. Yeah. Right? I love it. Thank you so much for the work that you do. It, I think that, and I think, I think that the listeners will really agree that um, where everyone's being followed a little bit by the depression, if not depression, the self judgment. So all of this is so, uh, you know, practical. Cool. Mm, thank you so much. Yep. Um, please know that this podcast should not replace me- professional mental health care. Uh, this podcast is for psychoeducation purposes only. So if you feel you would benefit by mental health care, please reach a mental health professional in your area. Have a wonderful day.